Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, the second half of the third stave. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt-collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose, and known it for their own. And, basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table, and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire, until the slow potatoes, bubbling up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid, to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha, weren't as late last Christmas by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said a girl, appearing, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's Martha, mother,' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are!' said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. "'We'd a deal of work to finish up last night,' replied the girl, "'and had to clear away this morning, mother.' "'Well, never mind so long as you are come,' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm... "'Lord bless ye!' "'No, no, there's father coming,' cried the two young Cratchits, "'who were everywhere at once. "'Hide, Martha, hide!' "'So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, and "'the father, with at least three feet of comforter, "'exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him, "'and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable.' and tiny tim upon his shoulder alas for tiny tim for he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame why where's our martha cried bob cratchit looking around not coming said mrs cratchit not coming said bob with a sudden declension in his high spirits for he had been tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant not coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed, if it were only a joke. So she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Barb. Bob on his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. How, somehow, he gets thoughtful, sitting by himself so much, and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church, because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember, upon Christmas Day, who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, and while Bob, turning up his cuffs as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hub to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession, high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose, the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, to which a black swan was a matter of goose, of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. P Master Peter mashed the potatoes with such incredible vigor, Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce, Martha dusted the hot plates, Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table, and the two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and, mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before they 
their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, the grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight rose round the board. And even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose, Bob said. He didn't believe there was ever such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish. They hadn't ate it all at last, yet every one had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have gone over the wall of the backyard and stolen it, while they were merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. The s a smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house on and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly, with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half and of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and belight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding! Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that, now the weight was off her mind, she would confess that she had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat hearsay to do so, and any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept, and the fire made up, the compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table, and a shovel of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half of one, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers, and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and crackled noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, every one, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. He sat very close to his father's side, upon his little stool, Bob held his withered little hand in his, as if he loved the child, and wished to keep him by his side, and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other than other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. Man, said the ghost, if man you be in heart, not adamant, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Will you decide what men shall live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. Oh, God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing that on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Scrooge bent before the ghost rebuke, and 
trembling, cast his eyes upon the ground, but he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake, and the days, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas, and a happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings, which had no heartiness in it. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care for two pence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times merrier than before, from the mere relief of Scrooge the baleful being done with. Bob Cratchit told them how he had situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring in, if obtained, five full five and sixpence weekly. The young, two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favor when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income martha who was a poor apprentice at a milliner's shop then took them what kind of work she had to do then told them what kind of work she had to do and how many hours she had worked in a stretch and how she meant to lie abed to-morrow morning for all the good long rest to-morrow being a holiday she had passed she passed at home and also how she seen a countess and a lord some days before, and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round, and by and by they say had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow, from Tiny Tim, who had a plaintive little voice, and sang it very well indeed. There was nothing of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty, and Peter might have known, and very likely did, the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sparklings of the crisp spirit's torch at parting. Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last.